Um, Jared Ward is in the house. He's going to be your keynote for the next section. I also want to point out that Jared Covili is here. Jared's in the back. He's going to be signing autographs later today. Um, and then um, Camille, I'm sorry, but Jared Leto is not here. Okay, so we're going to turn it over to Jared Ward here, and he's going to talk about just exactly what is a flipped classroom. That was the first time I've seen that video. That was hilarious. Nice job, Michael. But the website still is the same. Um, you know, we didn't want to release that until the video was released, and so now it's going to get changed soon. It was all part of the plan. After the launch of the website, now we can change the or the video. Now we can change the website. So. Um, well, welcome everybody. I, I, uh, my name is Jared Ward, and I'm really excited to have you all here. I'm always impressed that people show up to stuff like this. We had this idea a couple years ago, and we thought, uh, you know, how can we get teachers interested in the flipped classroom? I, I think I, if you were here last year, you kind of heard this story maybe, but uh, we started this as a, hey, let's teach a class to our teachers in Canyons District. And then uh, I have to blame, uh, Rachel Murphy and Ross Rogers, they stopped me in the hall once and they said, hey, how about instead of a class, we make it a conference? And I said, I don't know how to make a conference. And so then they started making a conference and that's what this has kind of turned into. And we're pretty excited about it. We are hoping that we can attract a few more of you Southern Utah folks and outlying districts and uh, move this up a little bit. Some of those people start school this week, which is crazy, but uh, we had a really tough time with the schedule, getting everything to work out. This is about the best we could do this year, and we know it's right before school starts, so we, we're glad you're here. We hope this is the kind of conference that uh, gets you excited about the school year and gives you some energy as you get ready to go back to class and start planning your year. That's what we really want this to be, is kind of a fun, laid-back opportunity to learn and, and really get your hands on some uh, concrete ideas as you build your lessons for the year. Uh, so I like to talk about what flipped learning is. Why are we all here? What's the point? Uh, what are we hoping to share with you? And what do we hope you get out of this conference? There's a lot of quotes and buzzwords and ideas. This whole flipped classroom idea is fairly new in the world of education pedagogy, right? There are a lot of concepts out there that have been around for a really long time. This flipped classroom idea is not very old, at least not the, the term flipped classroom. I, I started when I was a ceramics teacher here at Jordan High. I got uh, kind of tired of reteaching everything every day. And I started making videos and I'd put them on YouTube and my kids would go watch those instead of me having to reteach daily all of the things that they had missed when they were gone. And uh, uh, the whole flipped classroom concept didn't exist in my vocabulary back then. That wasn't part of the deal. And that was only five years ago that that existence, at least for me. I know that the idea was there, but I hadn't heard of it. And uh, so now what's happened is this flipped classroom has kind of evolved in, into this idea of flipped learning, where there's really concrete structure and supports to help you as the teacher find your footing as you try to navigate what you're building in your classroom with what your district or your school wants you to build as far as instruction goes. And so there's uh, one of my favorite things we've got this year that's a little different than last year. We've got this four pillars of the flip, and I'm going to touch on that, but this is our text for the day. We didn't want to get too in-depth, but this is really where our foundation is being built for this whole conference. Uh, we'll talk about that. But I like this quote about what a flipped classroom is all about, um, flipped learning is about. It's where direct instruction moves from the group learning space to the individual learning space. And that's a great way to sum it up to your principals if they're saying, hey, now what are you doing with this flip thing in your room? You're just gonna tell them some of the basics and say, this is what my goal is, is to make the group learning space a group learning environment where everybody comes together and learns together. And uh, I can move some of my lecture to their individual learning space where they can collect those ideas and focus on what I'm saying a little better. Um, and you, you've been in those lectures where you're teaching in front of the class and instead of delivering your, delivering your instruction, it's 
Louise, put your phone away. Now's not the time. I know I have a lot of phones, but put it away, and then you move on. All right. Sarah, really, stop talking to the Bob. You gotta knock it off. We're trying to focus. Everybody's trying to work together. You've got all these lectures uh, that you've got planned, but the kids constantly interrupt, right? If you can take that half hour, 45 minute lecture where you've got all these interruptions from students, the bell rings, the PA comes on asking for a kid to be let out of your class. Uh, you've got all those things that interrupt you. If you can condense your thoughts into a five or 10 minute video and put um, all of your ideas together in a short clip that they can watch at home, then you can really dive into the material in your class. And that's what we're really hoping to do. I like this. The, the, uh, a couple of years ago, Instructure had a conference, and this was kind of their theme. And I really, I really like this idea of flipped classroom because it lets teachers be teachers again. Uh, we're being told to do a lot of different things. Uh, pulled a lot of different directions by not just state or local education agendas, but by national education agendas. There's a lot of things on our plates and a lot of things we're asked to do. And this flipped classroom idea is teacher-driven, teacher-led. This is a conference started by teachers, for teachers. Um, we all are building this kind of on our own without any kind of race to the top funds or no child left behind mandate. This is what teachers want and what we're looking for to make our classrooms better. And, and we know it works, but it's uh, places like this where we share ideas to really make it happen. So that's uh, one of the reasons I like flipped classrooms. I included this slide. This is John Bergman, the really fuzzy guy that's moving fast, and Aaron Sams. They were kind of the co-creators. Um, they kind of crystallized this idea and wrote the first real book about, about it. Um, and they have mentioned that, talked about how teaching is an art. Um, it's where relationships, curiosity, and content meet. And that's what it's all about. And in a flipped classroom, you've got more time to interact with your kids, more time to spend on content, and more time to let students kind of tap into their own curiosity and build something that is really their own. So here's the four pillars and 11 indicators. I want to talk through those just, again, this is our foundation. We've got it on our, a couple of us have it on some shirts that Michael made. I don't know where he finds the time. He makes videos, he prints shirts, uh, does flips. <laughs> Dresses up like the guy from uh, The Christmas Carol. <laughs> Do you see those bandages? That was hilarious. Um, and he was Jacob Marley from The Christmas Carol. The old one too, not the, anyway. Um, so there's four pillars and 11 indicators are on your handout. The four pillars, it kind of takes that flip and turns it into an acronym. So we've got flexible environment. And I'd like to sum this up as saying, uh, in a flexible environment, that's your flipped classroom. The environment that you set up, the place where you have your kids working, uh, the systems that you put into place on a daily basis, that's really what a flipped classroom is. The rest of them connect with flipped learning. Uh, so the L is a learning culture. Uh, let me go through these, because we might as well talk about them. So in a flexible environment, how many of you uh, on, these, on the back of your sheet here, how many of you, does this sound like things that you already do? Um, you establish spaces and time frames, that one's important, that permit students to interact and reflect on their learning as needed. I continually observe and monitor students and make adjustments as appropriate. I provide students with different ways to learn content and demonstrate mastery. How many of you do those things already? Maybe not every day, all the time, but how many of you do those things? Right? We're all kind of doing this flipped idea already. We want to give students supports that help them be successful. We give them flexible time frames. We try anyway. Sometimes due dates are important, but sometimes if they learn it on Wednesday and the rest of the class learned it on Tuesday, it's not that big of a deal. Um, and so those concepts are kind of coming through our schools already. This mastery-based learning is standards-based grading. That's something that exists in the world, right, that we're all hearing about. Uh, we may or may not love it. But it ties with this flip, flip classroom idea where you're providing opportunities for your kids to learn when they're ready to learn it. And that, that is important. That's what's behind that whole idea. Um, the next one, learning culture. Um, in a learning culture, I, I give students opportunities to engage in meaningful activities without the teacher being central. And I scaffold these activities to make them accessible to all students. 
So you've got opportunities to reach every single kid. You've got scaffolded learning experiences so that children, the students in your classes can choose the, the assessments or the projects to demonstrate their learning in a way that matches their interests. We, uh, we, in our Canvas session yesterday, I, I feel like I've given this talk, this uh, presentation the last couple of days, twice in a row, but in our Canvas presentations yesterday, we talked about this exact thing, that uh, you know, when we're teaching with all these mobile devices and other you know, electronic devices that students have either in front of them or in their hands or in their pockets, writing an essay may not be the best assessment for every kid, and they already have the tools to present something else. And the first time you take that lesson and you say, you can do an essay, here's my rubric, and as long as your essay includes these things, you can do an essay if you want to write. If you don't want to write, you can make a video. Here's my rubric, it matches all those things. If your video includes that, you're done. You can create a photo collage, you can create a book. If there are things that students want to create that match their learning and interests, uh, and, we, and we can figure out a way to let them do those things, uh, and the technology makes it so much easier. It's, it's amazing how that's changed in the last couple of years. But if we can figure out a way to let students demonstrate their learning in a way that's unique to them and interests them, they're more engaged, they're more excited, they, and they tend to go beyond what we ask of them. Uh, that's come up over and over with the classes that we've taught uh, on using Canvas and iPads and all of those uh, new blended learning technologies that we're talking about. It comes up over and over and over. When I let my students step outside of the boundaries of what I think a traditional assignment should look like, they extend. They don't hide behind the technology. They go beyond what I'm asking of them and they really demonstrate what they've learned in amazing ways. So that's learning culture. Um, intentional content. Um, and again, I think this is stuff that we might already be doing. I prioritize concepts in a direct instruction, with in, used in direct instruction for learners to access on their own. I create and or curate relevant content, typically videos, uh, for my students. I differentiate to make content accessible and relevant to all students. Again, how many of you are, are doing or really trying to do these things? Differentiate, create learning opportunities in different places. How many of you are already doing it? Don't be scared. It's a lot of us, right? We're doing those things, but what's the hard part about differentiating and creating different types of lessons for different students? Time. And it is hard, and this flipped classroom idea is not an easy thing. It's not always a time saver, but it can be. Once you've got the, the framework in place, the content in place, a couple videos in place, or resources that you're curating in place, um, it, it gets easier as you go, right? How many of you flipped your classroom already? Some or all? It gets easier as you go, right? The more you do it, the less you have to prepare and create. Um, and so you've got these learning opportunities that meet different students' needs and they, and they really do much better. And then the last thing is professional educator. Um, the reason we're choosing this framework and uh, working inside of it in all of our sessions over the next couple of days is because we want to make sure we're doing this right. We don't ever want to have anybody tell us um, that, oh yeah, so-and-so is flipping their classroom, all he does is show videos all day. That can't happen in our classrooms, and, and we don't want anybody to think that's what a flipped classroom is. So you're here, you're the ambassadors of flipped classrooms for the state of Utah, that's how I see it. We're gonna take this idea and go back to our schools and show anybody who might be borrowing this idea and doing it just a little bit wrong. We're gonna help them see what's right, we're gonna help our administrators see how great it is, and uh, make sure that they understand that we're really working hard for the best interests of our students. Does that sound all right? Okay, can I get an amen? That's, that's really what the whole point of this uh, conference is for. We really wanna make sure that this, this flipped classroom idea is done well, and that we're all moving back to our schools, taking this idea back in a way that really benefits our students and excites them and excites us. Uh, one, one of the things we talked about last year is teachers who flip their classrooms have a 75% higher job satisfaction rate than the ones who don't. I'm on board with that idea, right? I could use a little more job satisfaction, uh, especially these days. So again, this is a chance for us to uh, improve ourselves, improve our students, and really reach them where they are. 
When I've talked about flipped classrooms, I've found that there are five keys. I've presented with Jared Covili, and we talked about these exact same things, so I have to give him credit uh, for this idea. Um, in fact, I think this might be his slide once. But uh, we've, I've stolen this idea from him, and as we've talked about this, I think these are the really important parts of a flipped classroom. You need to understand why. If you just like making videos, you might not be flipping your classroom if you just like making videos. But so you've got to really understand the why. That's the most important part. And then there are different models for engaged learning. You've got to have some kind of pedagogy or some structure behind your content and plans. Uh, you've got to understand the technology tools. What training and resources do you need to accomplish this? And then a uh, little self-reflection and setting up a proper infrastructure is important. So here's some of the whys that I could think of. I'd love to hear some of yours. Um, I like that it makes students a little bit responsible for their own learning. The big question is always, what if my students don't watch the video when they're supposed to go home and watch the video? And that, I mean, the answer is as simple as the question, really. Um, what did they do before if they didn't do their homework? What was the consequence? What happened? Uh, and the, the answer may not be the same, the consequence might not be the same, but we all, we've always been dealing with kids who aren't motivated, who won't go home and do the work. You know, how do we intervene and help get them excited about it? So those are my ideas. Will anybody have any more they'd like to add? I'd love to hear yours. Why do you flip or why do you want to? Well, because I want better relationships with kids. Yeah. What grade do you teach? Seventh. Seventh. Nice. Why don't she want a better relationship with her students? And that happens. Yeah. Conserve class time. What's that? Conserve class, Conserve class time. time. Yeah. Lectures take a long time. Right? Yeah. Well, I wanted to do the fun stuff. <laughs> I couldn't do any of the application yeah. fun stuff because all I was doing was the instruction. Yeah. So getting hands on with the content is important. I, I think most teachers want that. It's, that's why we signed up was to do the fun stuff. Yeah. If I just talked about making pots all day, I wouldn't have been a very fun ceramics teacher. We just got the clay out and we started. That I mean, that's why we. That's why I signed up. Somebody else back here. Yeah. Uh, if a student's absent, they can just look yeah. at the video, or if they need to see it more than once, they can just run it again. Yeah. Run yeah. Anybody who's absent or misses or needs to watch over and over. How many of you who flipped your classroom um, make your own videos? How many of you use other videos? How many of you do both? Right. Um, and what's nice about making your own videos, in the last couple of years, that's gotten really, really easy. It used to be kind of a deal, like you had to have software and some nice mics and some other programs to make it happen. Now you can do it from an iPhone or an iPad or any other mobile device and do it from your computer for free. We've got some great sessions to teach you some tips and tools for making videos, so great. Anybody else want to share one last why? There's one more hand. All right. Um, the next, models for engaged learning. And I just added a couple of these after ISTE. I didn't get to go to ISTE. Hashtag MISTE. Um, <laughs> but I used to just have three bullets in this slide. Project-based learning, which is where they're working with projects. They're working hands-on. It's really directed more around how do I get my kids to build something, make something out of what I'm teaching. Game-based learning or gamification of learning, which is changing all the time. How many of you heard, have heard of Kahoot? Kahoot it. Um, I don't know, Camille, you're, you're not teaching that, are you? You're just excited about it. <laughs> if you want to talk about Kahoot, talk to Camille. She, it's uh, what, what Kahoot, how many of you have used clickers in your classroom before? What Kahoot does is take the clicker idea and makes it a game. Students who answer first get more points. Students who answer right get the most points. And so it becomes a game, so they get kind of engaged. And I should have made a quiz in Kahoot now that I'm going to talk about it. That would have been fun. And next year, I'm all over it. Uh, but adults kind of like it too. We were playing along from our darkened room watching a session of ISTE on the video just down the hall here. And uh, we were playing along and getting kind of into it. I think Janae won. But uh, I was close. I was a close second. But it didn't really matter because somebody in Atlanta won the real contest. Troublemakers out there. Um, technology tools. I found this. I used this. I used the Haiku Deck to build this Haiku Deck to build this whole presentation. And I found uh, this slide. I loved it. How many of you remember what that Sony 
I, I don't remember what it is. I'm really oh, asking. Um, What's that Sony e reader? <laughs> anyway, we have one at Jordan High somewhere. Our librarian got really excited about it and bought one. Um, but anyway, there's an iPad there. Looks nice. But the technology tools that are available have changed so dramatically. And again, if you're into tools and want to learn some tips and tricks, um, it's Cammy's birthday. Don't worry about it. Thanks, Facebook. Um, but uh, if you're into tools, we've got some sessions just for you. Self-reflection. It's important to look back at what you're doing and see if it's working or not. And also reflect on data that you collect from your students, from your parents, from your admins. Goodness. Thanks, Bob. Bob's on. Bob Jackman, he's on Facebook right now, sending me a friend request. <laughs> then, oh man, I hope I didn't ruin this. I had problems with this program and it won't save my session for me. Anybody else had that before? In Haiku Deck? I need a net tech to help me fix this sometime before the end of the day. Yeah, there's a couple here I've heard. And then this infrastructure for success idea is the last of those five keys. Um, I do recommend starting slow, though I've known teachers who just jump in and go for it. Uh, Sarah was a good example at Brighton High. She was our keynote last year if you were here. And, uh, she's been a huge example to other teachers in our district of how to get this done. Uh, she just decided in the middle of a school year, at one trimester, she's like, I've heard of this, I think I can do it, I'm going to go for it. And uh, I don't think she slept for three months, but she got it done and uh, started teaching and had data to back up how her students were improving their performance and their satisfaction in class. Parents loved it. Uh, so it was, a, it was a success for her, for sure. So you can check chat with her. Sarah, raise your hand so everybody... Yeah. She's presenting next, right, at 9 o'clock. You've got a session, so we'll, I'll talk about the schedule here in a minute. Um, here's some extra bonus tips just for you. Uh, my biggest point of advice is avoid teaching one and a half classes, just like there are one and a half turtles there. It's hard to find a picture of one and a half turtles. I've looked, and most of the ones I found are really inappropriate. Um, but that counts, right? But what teachers sometimes do is they'll take the lecture out of the classroom and they'll have this extra class time and they'll teach more content. Don't do that. You'll kill yourself. You'll wear yourself out in a week. Um, what that gives you more time to do is be hands-on and more in-depth with the stuff you're already teaching. So don't teach one and a half classes. Don't go further than you would normally go. Keep your similar or same scope and sequence. Uh, don't teach one and a half classes. Except, Jared, you actually, I'm ready. you actually get to teach more. You can. I mean, we this year when I flipped, I got so much, I mean, seriously, I've never covered as much math as I covered this year because they were doing it and we can we can move at a much more rapid pace. Yeah. And so there was a lot more. Than a lot more covered. time. I, I guess my point is that that shouldn't be your goal is I, I'm, I'm lacking in, in time to get through all the content. If that's your, your only goal, I mean, and it, it works, it does happen. But if that's your main point, your main priority is to get through one and a half classes of content, I think you're gonna wear yourself out. But if it happens, if, as you keep going, then you no, can add more things. It's, I mean, I had, I had planned my flipping through January. Yeah. And December, I'm like, gosh, they're get, we're getting through this so fast, I gotta get caught keep up going. myself because I, I it usually takes us that long. Very good. And it didn't. Other people, have you found the same thing? Do you have more time to cover more content? What do you think? More time, more content? I need to take that slide out. <laughs> well, no, because no, what you're saying is right. Yeah. You don't want to add that extra thing. But but I learned my, you know, last year, my first year, you know, that it, because they were doing it and they came excited and we could engage, then we could move on. I wasn't yeah. spending three days on something that should take me one day. Very nice. What grade do you teach? I teach fourth grade. Fourth grade. All right. How many elementary teachers are here? I just want to point this out. Raise your hands high if you're an elementary teacher. Is that it? Raise your hand high if you're a secondary teacher. We're pretty evenly split. Raise your hand if you'd call yourself an other. Yeah, so that's what it is. Um, but this flipped classroom idea started in secondary schools. Uh, and 
higher ed, it's been adopted there pretty successfully, but it's starting to come to elementary schools and a flipped elementary classroom looks a little different than a flipped secondary classroom, but uh, it can be very successful. And we've got some great pre uh, presentations. Most of our presenters uh, that are showing classroom models, classroom examples, most of them are elementaries this year. And so that's a, that's a flip for us. It was a lot of secondary last year. And that was a lot of your, oh, I gotta stay on that slide. That was some of your feedback from last year as you wanted more elementary stuff, so we, we found it. Um, my next bit of bonus advice is use an LMS, whether it's Moodle or, uh, what's the other one? Edmodo, that's a fantastic one. How many of you use Edmodo? Right, it's a great program. We use Canvas in our district because we paid for it, so we might as well use it. And we love it, it's fantastic. It works really well for what our students need. Um, but it gives you an opportunity to interact with the content. If you need to know if your students watch the video, something like Canvas or maybe Blend Space or something like that is gonna help you get uh, data on whether or not your students have seen what you need them to see. And that they understand what you've taught in your videos or your other lessons. Uh, I steal this from Sarah. She's got some great tips on her website. Um, She's got these tips for quality videos. Use a planning guide, and she's got a great planning guide for videos on her website as well. What's your website where I steal all this from? Um, Flipphysics.com. Flipphysics.com, and physics is F-I-Z-Z-I-C-S. No, I-X. I-X, that's very much cooler. What? <laughs> that's good. I didn't even notice, because I'm a ceramics teacher. Flipped <laughs> physics. <laughs> So flipped is spelled F-L-I-P-P-E-D, but then physics is F-I-Z-Z-I-X dot com is her website. And uh, she's got some great resources there. So use a planning guide, keep it simple, keep it to one concept, especially in the lower grades. Uh, what we've kind of found and read and heard is that the video length for elementary grades is three minutes, maybe up to five, depending on the concept, middle grades, uh, middle school, five to seven minutes. High school, seven to nine. Um, although we've seen videos 10 to 12 minutes long and they seem to be just fine depending on the content and the students that you teach. You know best what your students can take in and what they can handle, so use your judgment there. Uh, I'm gonna skip through that. Um, that's kind of my whole presentation about why we're here. I just wanna talk about the sessions, how everything's gonna work the next couple of days. Our website, has all of our sessions listed. Uh, we also have an app that I'll talk about in a second. We have a few of you in the app, maybe, I don't know, about a quarter of us are on the app right now. But underneath each session is F, L, I, or P, or a combination of all of them. We can't use uh, Reproduce, the Flipped Learning Network session. Uh, we can't adapt it, modify it, see they have a copyright thing down here, Creative Commons license. We can reprint it as long as we don't sell it to you, so this is free. This wasn't part of your $40. We're just giving you this. <laughs> um, so all of the stuff that is here, we've just adapted into a pretty colorful uh, flipped model, but the concepts are all still about the same. Um, so if you're looking for something that te teaches you about how to structure your class, that's going to be the F sessions. Something about intentional content, which really for us means creating the content, creating videos, creating instruction. Those are I. Um, the L, the learning environment, that one's going to be more hands-on what it looks like in your classroom, especially our teacher examples. And then the P is professional educator, how you manage that as a teacher. Uh, so look for those sessions. They'll be connected there. Your presenters will be connecting their concepts. At least in the first few minutes, they'll talk about how their session covers each of these. So look for that. Um, I think I've talked through that, I think we're good. Michael talked about how this is a workshop format. We really want you hands on about half of the time today in your sessions, so uh, don't feel bad if you wanna get some work done. That's what we're here for. Um, apparently Daniel Craig's on of Enjoy, because I found this photo. It's actually from the App Store, and maybe they made it up and put him on there. I think he's a fine James Bond, but every woman I talk to says no. Anybody want to chime in? <laughs> Not the time or the place to screw that up. But EventJoy has some cool things. If you're here, how many of you are here from out of town? And you maybe want to go to dinner tonight with some friends who are here from out of town. You can set up an event and say, hey, I'm going to go to 
some new restaurant, anybody want to join me? And you can do that through EventJoy. But you also get all of the sessions there, color-coded and labeled. Um, all of our uh, group events are highlighted in yellow, so you can kind of see when you need to be back here. And uh, there's a place to tweet right from the app. It adds our hashtag automatically for you, so you have flip, flip in Utah. Did he spell it right? He did. Nice job. Um, so yeah, yeah, Flip in Utah added to your tweets, or you can tweet from whatever platform you like. So it's a great app. We really like it. It's free. And uh, I think next year we're going to use it for our registration so we don't have the Google form and PayPal mess. I apologize for that if you guys had problems. It worked out. We survived. But I think we're going to run everything through this next year so it's a lot more simple. And that's all I have. Any last questions? Okay, I'm gonna let Michael come back up, introduce the rest of the day, and then Camille is gonna talk to you about an idea that we've got for later this afternoon.